Madam Chair, members of the board, <laughs> I have a pretty comprehensive update for you tonight that's going to touch on a wide range of financial and economic topics. So uh, please stop me at any point if if you have questions, because we are going to jump from topic to topic. And mine's a little bit more of a hybrid in that uh, trying to provide an update, as uh, Dr. Casey said, about sort of the economic backdrop. But at the same time, there are a number of action items uh, before you this evening. So this is really meant to give you the update piece as well as a preview and, and discussion period for a number of items, uh, again, that are wide ranging in, in, in topic area that are on your agenda tonight. Uh, with that, we'll go to the uh, go to the first slide. Uh, Try to put our heads together and think of the the best way to describe and show sort of the economic impact here. And, and th these slides are not in here for a, a fear factor uh, of any variety. But I think the reality is, you know, we, we talk about reopening and we want to make sure we're being responsive to, you know, the basic services that we need to provide. But the reality is, you know, sitting behind that is still a very challenging economy. And, uh, you know, it's, we're going to have to work hard to find that, that balance between providing uh, effective and responsive service, but also being mindful of the economic realities that are before us. This this chart here, um, and, and I'm showing tonight more U.S. information just because we get that much more readily than we do local data. Uh, we still have very, very little Chesterfield-specific economic data. So I'll touch on a few points or how we're trying to really get on top of that, but most of what I have to show you on the economic front is U.S., it, this is the scale of this chart that I really want you to focus on. You see there are little, what look like very little bars uh, up top just north of the zero uh, on that sort of horizontal axis. That That's representing job growth in the broad U.S. economy since the, uh, really during the expansion period since the last recession. And on average, you know, the U.S. economy during that period is averaging about 200,000 new jobs per month. During the month of April, we lost uh, over 20 million jobs in a single month. So that's that's representative of 100 months of job growth that disappeared overnight. And you can see what it does to the scale of what is a, a common economic chart. Um, just just unbelievable. These these charts hopefully will never be. Uh, repeated, but I think this, again, the scale is really what I wanted to impress upon everyone. And just a reminder that we, we focus very heavily on the virus, but the economic impacts from the virus are, are as real. Next slide. Same general pattern here. This is a little closer to home. These are unemployment insurance payments for uh, Chesterfield County. Um, and these are annual figures going back to, to 2000. And you can see the scale again. Don't worry about necessarily the numbers themselves because they won't have any real context. But the scale of this chart, I think, speaks very clearly. You see, you know, what was considered to be the Great Recession in 09 and 10. And you see the, uh, the, the spike there in unemployment insurance payments compared to where we are now uh, just through, you know, four months of 2020 were already it dwarfs the worst year from from the great recession so again just trying to uh, to impress upon the scale of the economic disruption that we're looking at next slide retail sales this is uh, some more recent US data and you can see again year over year April sales down uh, almost 22 percent that is the uh, the biggest decline on record. And again, you can see how it compares to the uh, period on the left-hand side, 08, 09. We thought in the Great Recession, but you see the, uh, the scale of this decline, again, far outpaces what we experienced the last time around. Um, I, I think the interesting thing here is we've seen, um, although overall over 20% decline in, in sales for April, our, our internal forecast for uh, Chesterfield was about a 26% decline, so that's what we had built into the budget. So we are, you know, we're on par with this. We, we like to be uh, more conservative than what we're seeing, so we feel pretty good about that. We don't have any real local sales tax data just yet. We have March numbers, but March was a, a mixed month as it was nationally, so we don't have the April 
figures yet. We will share those as soon as they come in. But I think the interesting thing is sort of one of those long-term impacts of what we're looking at. Online sales uh, represent now over 20% of total retail sales. They were up almost 9% during April. So you really are seeing a significant shift online sales uh, having some of their best months uh, on record. So it will be interesting to kind of see if that bounces back into the brick and mortar world or if that uh, that pattern is here to stay. Next slide. Not having a whole lot of uh, official economic or economic data for Chesterfield, we are we have turned to uh, to non-traditional sources. Um, Gerard Durkin in the uh, in the budget department has really taken this to heart. And you see here, this is actually vehicle miles traveled in Chesterfield County on a daily basis. And we are looking at this, uh, you know, not from a transportation perspective, but really as a measure of activity. And you can see, you know, we were averaging around 15 million miles a day traveled. That dropped down uh, really in late March and April to around 5 million. But you see that steady creep up towards the end of the picture here, back up to 10 million. And the last data point that's uh, plotted here, but this pattern has begun to creep back up towards that long run average of 15 million. So we're still 5 million less miles per day, but this does give us a much quicker read on activity levels in the Chesterfield economy. And certainly with some of the things that uh, Mr. Hart talked about, we would expect to see this pattern continue to creep up. But it, we have a number of these non-traditional data sources that we're using to track activity on a daily basis and not having to wait around two or three months later for uh, another data series to be published to give us a sense of what's going on. Next slide. So let me uh, jump in and again, we're going to skip around from financial topic to financial topic. I'm going to start with CARES. Um, we worked closely with, uh, with Mr. Hart and his team to launch tonight the back in business program uh, as part of our CARES allocation. So there's, there are three allocations for Chesterfield County in terms of CARES uh, that are really in play thus far. The school system is receiving some money, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, there's been an additional allocation within the Community Development Block Grant Program as a result of CARES. And then about two weeks ago, we got a letter from the state saying that Chesterfield would receive almost $31 million of CARES funding. Uh, that disbursement is supposed to expected to happen next week. Uh, we are still going through the guidance associated with this, but it is uh, cumbersome to say the best, to say the least. Um, so we will continue to review that for how you can spend the money. This one works a little bit differently in that they are going to send us all $30.8 million, and then you have to work within the guidelines to spend it all by the end of the calendar year. Um, our general approach, and you know, I don't have a specific plan for you tonight because we, uh, in Chesterfield, as they are throughout the Commonwealth, trying to figure out the rule book and make sure that we do not run afoul of the guidance that is out there from uh, the Treasury Department and others, but our, I think our general framework for spending these funds fall in one of three categories, and I just want to run through those for you tonight, not having any more specifics other than what's been discussed as part of the economic development package. First and foremost, we want to reimburse ourselves for eligible expenditures that we have had that were unbudgeted, unexpected and that have put us in a, in a tough financial place for the current year, and then things that uh, likewise we would expect to spend because of corona in fiscal 21. So that's category number one, that's pretty self-explanatory. Category two uh, really looks at strategic investments. You can make certain strategic investments in the organization. A good example for us would be making sure that we are prepared for further telework activities in Chesapeake County so that if this were to happen again or if it continues to drag out or if there's a second wave, whatever it might be, that we are flexible enough from a workforce perspective that folks can uh, can move about, work from home, be safe, and continue to deliver services. The third leg of the stool would really be those strategic community investments. You saw the beginning of that tonight and can't reiterate the, uh, the importance of that enough, $5 million for small business assistance. But there are other categories in those, str in those strategic community investments that we are looking at um, and working with uh, folks in and out of the organization to try to figure out where there may be suitable 
matches for the community needs and the, the CARES guidance. So we're continuing to work through this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it, maybe even in audit and finance next week. But certainly by June, as we go through your year-end actions, we'll have more specific ideas uh, really around the what we can reimburse ourselves for in the current year. So we are looking at the, sort of that three-pronged strategy as it relates to uh, the Chesterfield general government portion of CARES. Next slide. So let's talk about transition a little bit, shift gears to uh, a couple of action items that are on your consent agenda tonight. And I'm going to reiterate and recap what is uh, before you tonight and what's just informational. First and foremost, uh, there's a, a budget amendments we told you back in April. I have to think very hard what month it actually is, uh, but I think this is May. So in April, we would have gone and approved a budget to get it in place by May 1. And we said at that time we did not have the state information and there would be amendments to the school budget and the county budget at the May meeting based on what came down from the state. So the next two slides really follow through uh, on that thought. Uh, on the school side, they reduced their budget overall by almost uh, a little over $23 million. You had taken action at your last meeting to reduce the county transfer by only about $2.9 million. And remembering that the inverse of that, which I think is more important, the, the support for education from the Board of Supervisors is still almost $10 million more than the prior year, despite all of the other economic news that we've heard here tonight. So I think that always bears repeating. But uh, that $23 million, the school board took um, your action and coupled it with what happened at the state level to remove those $23 million. And I think Overall, we can get into the specifics if there are questions. There's a really good packet of information in your agenda packet, but I think the school board did a nice job of mirroring uh, their reduction strategies to what the board did, and uh, the finance teams worked together to make that happen. Things like eliminating the merit increase, um, which you know that pulls out eight plus million dollars uh, on the on the school side right there. But more importantly, preserving things like major maintenance, we have worked very hard uh, as a collective body to reinvest in major maintenance uh, categories and, and line items. And the school board took that very seriously and did not touch those as part of uh, this reduction strategy. There were state initiatives that were uh, removed, uh, mandates. So that saved some money, see the $4.6 million. And then a lot of discretionary items, the 12.7 that's shown there in the chart. And that would be akin to all of the additional funding requests that the Board of Supervisors either remove completely from consideration in fiscal 21 or just defer to some later date uh, in the year where we could revisit those. So uh, both sides followed the same playbook for, for the budget reductions that were necessary because of the virus. Next slide. Smaller bit of business on our side, the general government budget reducing by about uh, $1.8 million, primarily from, again, state reduction in, in revenues. We always work conservatively when it comes to state revenues just because they have a history of not showing up for one reason or another. So we didn't have to reduce as much as, uh, as some other uh, juridic jurisdictions might have had to do. You see the specific line items that we took uh, monies from um, really nothing that would tr overly uh, impact service levels anywhere holding additional vacancies as uh, retirements come online and uh, just looking and working very closely with the deputies to figure out where we can defer filling uh, vacancies so that we don't have any additional furloughs or anything uh, associated with this package but um, not hiring for uh, vacant positions outside of safety sensitive frontline stuff and in some select positions uh, really the the big ticket item there and then you see uh, deferring vehicle replacements again outside of uh, police cruisers or fire engines or those kinds of items um, and then you see down at the bottom worth noting one of the part of this math problem was moving some contingency dollars around so that we had a COVID-19 contingency for items that uh, we would need to spend, whether it's some of the things Mr. Zaremba talked about in terms of bringing services back sooner than we had anticipated, or things that just aren't covered by CARES. We wanted to have some flexibility restored in this budget. So there's half a million dollars set aside for uh, COVID-related items that can't otherwise be covered by CARES, 
or just things that uh, that we need to do to make sure that service levels are adequate for uh, for the community. Next slide. Uh, CDBG, um, as you would expect, uh, and as I mentioned, they got some additional uh, CARES funding, and uh, Mr. Cohen and his team did a nice job of really just kind of going in. Uh, again, there's, a, I think, one of the revised items is related to the CDBG funding, and they went in and really just spread those dollars, uh, $861,000, amongst the uh, programs and lines of business that had already been identified. Uh, you see some of the examples there, local business recovery, rental assistance, um, homelessness assistance, foreclosure assistance. So things that are really, really in keeping with what CARES tries to encourage you to do, but look for uh, existing partners and existing programs that they already had so that they're not going out and recreating things uh, in response to CARES, but really just investing further in those uh, known commodity. So a nice uh, a nice recommendation here. And again, this is on your uh, consent agenda as well. Next slide. Capital updates. There's nothing to do here, but I thought it was important to, to toss in because we've had a lot of questions on this particular item and I thought it uh, was worth discussing. Um, really, our perspective remains that November is not an appropriate time frame for uh, a referendum of you know, hundreds of millions of dollars with everything that's going on, but wanted to touch on a few points related to capital because I think the, there's been a misconception, uh, particularly amongst the community, that because there is a referendum that we're really shutting down our investment in capital facilities, and that's not true. Um, just earlier this month, we closed on a VPSA, which is a state program that allows us to borrow funds uh, for the Western 360 Elementary you know, near Magnolia Green. Um, and then we have a um, GO sale, a, a, a general obligation sale that closes out the last referendum, which is always important to make sure that you're following through on those promises that have already been vested to you. Uh, that will we will be working with the rating agencies and, and closing that transaction in July. So uh, there's still a lot of, of debt work going on to execute things that have uh, already been put into motion. Um, but uh, so just because there's not a referendum doesn't mean that we've slowed down on any of these projects that you're uh, that you're seeing here. We would expect to be able to push the referendum out just a year, and then we could begin borrowing um, off of that referendum as soon as January, or February. So in terms of uh, you know delay, you're really only looking at perhaps about a six month delay in terms of being able to fund those projects. All of that said. As soon as the economic condition is sort of normalized, it would be staff's recommendation to come back, go back through the CIP, and see if there are pieces and parts of projects that, at least from a design perspective, that we want to get started on. Uh, we know that there's some on, on the school side, some you know, some, maybe some middle school issues or whatever it might be, but those those opportunities still exist um, during the balance of fiscal 21. We don't need a referendum to begin design work on a, on a school facility. So. Uh, overarching message here is capital plan still very very much in motion and there are a lot of opportunities to to uh, move forward on this front although it won't be the full uh, full scale referendum this November next slide also on your agenda tonight and uh, related in many ways to uh, to capital efforts there the state allowed us to increase an existing fee uh, for court security, we've all recognized how, um, you know, particularly uh, Ms. Haley and those folks that to go into the uh, court facility on a regular basis, how that's changed over the years. So I think really in recognition of the increased security protocols, the state that allow us to increase this fee for uh, folks that uh, are, are found uh, guilty of various uh, charges throughout the court system from 10 to $20, it has to be used for court security costs, including uh, related personnel, but uh, certainly what we're spending there far outstrips the revenue that we're receiving to date. So increasing this charge from 10 to $20 would generate an additional $400,000 and working closely with Sheriff Leonard and his team to make sure that uh, we're being responsive to current capital and personnel needs on this topic. And then uh, as we move forward to make sure that we can make any uh, subsequent improvements. So this is one of these legislative items that uh, we're bringing forward at this meeting, really to just set the public hearing for June 
Uh, Mr. Minks will have a, a whole slate of other legislative topics for you in June, but to get a jump on this so it could be in place for July 1, we are asking to uh, set the public hearing for June tonight on your uh, consent agenda. Next slide. Um, this is a really important slide. I saw slow down just a second here and go through this. Uh, again, I apologize for the diverse amount of topics, but a lot of things to cover here tonight. This is a, a, a very important one. We want to make sure the message gets out on this. You've seen several examples here tonight of how we're working to help out our local businesses. Um, the utility division has uh, waived uh, penalties and fees on many of uh, on their monthly, bi-monthly bills. And I think that total is up over a quarter million dollars of relief there. Uh, we've done some things on occupancy taxes to try to provide some relief to, to that particular sector that's been hit hard. And sort of the one piece that uh, we wanted to continue to take a look at was what relief measures were we offering for just the, uh, your, your everyday uh, citizen. And so we have uh, worked very closely with the board and county administration, all the folks that take the phone calls every day, folks calling with questions and, and things for us to think about. And the number one thing we heard was uh, really trying to help out on the penalty for personal property. As you know, real estate is a different uh, animal. It is taken out in most cases as part of an escrow. It's paid twice a year. Uh, there's those mechanics that are built in to help you save and, and be prepared for those bills when they come due and really didn't hear very much, uh, if any, at least in, in, in my part of the world, uh, questions or concerns about the real estate side. But the personal property is once a year in June. Uh, that's not something where you have the built-in mechanics, again, to save for. So we work closely with uh, the treasurer and her staff and sort of consulted the board to put together a recommendation that's on your uh, public hearing agenda tonight to uh, do the following. Personal property taxes are still due June 5. However, if you cannot uh, make that date, penalties and interest do not kick in until July or until August 1st. So you have through the end of July and th through July 31st to make those payments without having to pay the 10% penalty, uh, which hitch all up front, and then the subsequent uh, interest payments that come along with that. Typically, beginning June 6th, the penalty would kick in on those accounts, and then beginning the first of the next month, the interest would begin. So we've structured it so both would not kick in until the beginning of August. So it gives uh, taxpayers who may be uh, struggling with this particular bill an additional eight weeks plus uh, to to make those payments and uh, and give them a little bit more time. Hopefully, the the economy begins to uh, to pick back up. Uh, it also applies to business personal property, so there is some additional relief for our Chesterfield businesses here. But again, none of this applies to real estate taxes. Those still do June five with the standard uh, protocols for penalties and interest on real estate. This is just personal property, but it's still due, due June five. But payments received up through July 31st, which is a Friday, uh, will not be assessed penalties and interest. So, again, public hearing on your, uh, I think it's your last item tonight to consider the measures to uh, to put this in place. But uh, a lot of thanks to the board and to the treasurer again. Uh, Ms. Longnaker has worked very hard to, uh, to put together a, a protocol, a plan, program for this that is responsive to the feedback that we've heard from the community. Next slide. So let me just summarize, because again, that's a lot of information across a lot of topics. Um, you, on your consent agenda, you have the amendments to the county and school budget related to the state actions. Um, really nothing uh, major to report there. I think you know we've been able to put together uh, plans for you that uh, that will fit in with our, our what we, where we expect it to be. You have the amendment to the CDBG program related to their CARES funding. That's on consent as well. A consent item to set the public hearing on the court security fee for June, holding the public hearing on personal property relief measures, and then the capital and CARES discussions, phone calls, emails on those topics. More to come on those. There will be action items ahead of you on those topics, but tonight those are just informational. So that's just a quick recap of uh, everything that we just went through. And we go to the next 
we'll go to the next slide. I think that's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Harris? Madam Chair, Madam just Chair. one question. Matt, how is consumer confidence um, being measured uh, in Chesterfield? I note that the stock market is very high, but the national measures of consumer confidence seem to be, if, if not low, at their lowest point in years. What's your read on that, and how do we measure that in Chesterfield? No, um, Mr. Winslow, I, I appreciate that question. I, I think, you know, we don't have an official consumer confidence index uh, at, at the local level anywhere, but I think really through some of those non-traditional measures, looking at the activity about how people are going out and re-engaging in, uh, in the local economy, that's, that's going to be our best read on that. We won't get the April sales tax data for still from some time, but uh, we've, and I've got a, there's, Tonight was just one of about half a dozen of these non-traditional measures that we're looking at. And I think that people's actions, you know, they vote with their feet. And I think when they're going out, driving, spending, all of those things, um, I think that speaks very loudly. And I think as the, the chart showed, even though it's a couple of days old, you know, we're starting to get close, back close to uh, traditional levels of activity, at least from a traffic perspective in the county which I think speaks well that people are trying to get out and re-engage. You heard some positive uh, anecdotes from Mr. Hart as well, that businesses were uh, well-received, at least on the restaurant front, this uh, last two weekends. So I think, you know, we feel like, you know, Chesterfield citizens and businesses are very resilient, and we, we feel, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic about the data we have thus far. Thank you, sir.